I'm Grant Oliphant. This is We Can Be. Today, our guest is Emily Collins, founder and executive director of Fair Shake, the nation's first nonprofit environmental law organization. Emily founded Fair Shake in 2013 to help those of limited means to gain access to legal help for cases involving the environment. There has been no shortage of cases ever since, from water safety, effects of fracking on communities, air pollution, and other issues arising from how we relate with the environment. Her organization serves the Appalachian Basin in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Emily teaches ethics in the environment at the University of Pittsburgh, and she literally runs through the community she serves. So, Emily, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate you doing this. I appreciate being here. Thank you. First of all, let's talk a little bit about the idea of a nonprofit law firm, which doesn't compute. (laughs) Tell me a little bit about that. The idea is that we are not just the nation's first environmental law firm that's nonprofit. We're also a residency program, Mm. very much like a medical school residency. We are training attorneys to do what we are doing, and we're giving them a business model for serving a modest means clientele. Clients who are within 300% of the poverty line, they're all pro bono. People above 300%, we charge on a sliding scale based on their income. There are some clients who we charge $11 an hour, (laughs) all the way up to, I think it's 500% of the poverty line who, you know, we're charging our, what we consider our full rate, which our full rate is actually lower than market rate. So we're never charging market rate. Do you ever turn a client away for having too much in the way of means? We have not. Most of the time, if a client has too much by way of means. They just haven't been able to find environmental counsel. So so they'll come to you. They'll come to us, yeah. And we're seeking to generate a business model for young attorneys who are seeking to start their own firms. Hmm. So we're non-competitive in many ways. We're almost hoping to go out of business so that we're filling the gap for clients with environmental needs. So you actually see this as being for a period of time? I think so. I hope so. No, I think there's a myth in the country that... If I have a case Mm -hmm. to be brought and there's an opportunity for damages to be recovered, that there will will always Mm -hmm. be a lawyer to represent me. Hmm. There are kind of two sides of that coin. So oftentimes we find clients who have personal injuries or property damage and they'll call us and say, you know, I ain't no environmentalist, but I've got a problem. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of cases, they're not always taken on by attorneys if they can't get sufficient damages. So we're there to serve those folks. And then there are clients who are really seeking to put an end to environmental violations. And we're able to do that through something called citizen suits. Uh, They've been in place since the 1970s, and you can utilize them to become a private attorney general, so seeking to enforce environmental laws in the same way that a state attorney general would. I think it's important for people to know who your clients are. Mm -hmm. Uh, So a typical client would come to you for what? Well, one that just comes to mind because of recent calls is underground injection wells to dispose of wastewater. So we will get calls from individual clients asking what they can do about it. Is it possible simply to move or contest the permit or they all have different goals. So we counsel clients through those, you know, what's possible. There are also small organizations and even mid-sized organizations. Sometimes we'll even represent the larger environmental organizations like the Sierra Club. Organizations typically are seeking to achieve more of a public interest result that can be replicated and set precedent. The Mountain Watershed Association is a frequent client of ours who fits that mold very well. But it could also be a neighborhood association coming together because, you know, shale gas development came to town or a pipeline is proposed to go through. Natural gas fire power plants is another issue we see a lot of community-based organizations coming to us for. So the current fight over the Clareton Coke Works, right. for example, right. would be an example. Yes, that's a very good example. That's actually a good example of both personal injury and property damage issues and citizen suit opportunities. 
A pair of environmental groups who say they're taking legal action against some major industrial facilities in our region. It all has to do with what they say is illegal pollution. A group of people who want to clean up the air in Clareton and the surrounding area called the Clean Air Council announced that they will be taking legal action. If you live in the Mon Valley, try and stay indoors. That is the message health officials are pushing today. A fire last month at U.S. Steel's Clareton Coke Works has affected the air quality in several communities. And this is a respiratory irritant, and so those people who have respiratory issues, especially people who do have asthma, this is one of those things that can trigger an asthma attack. 22 communities in the Mon Valley are affected, including West Mifflin, Jefferson Hills, Elizabeth, and of course here in Clareton. It all started with a fire inside the plant. You're from northeastern Ohio. I am. Was there anything in your childhood there mm. that gave you an interest in this work? And can you talk a little bit about your childhoods? Sure. Yeah. So I, I am from southern Tuscross County, and it's a very, very hilly part of Ohio. I can't even Ohio. pronounce that. So. I know. It's <laughs> Tuscross County. Only people from there can pronounce it, I think. But my childhood was spent on a 300-acre, mostly wooded farm, horse farm. And, you know, we didn't have much to do other than explore. So <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that I was destined, you know, for environmental law, but I found my way there pretty easily, pretty mm -hmm. naturally. Um, it just makes sense. My ancestors are mostly coal miners mm. so <laughs> and farmers. Mm. So there's something about living in a rural area that helps you identify with people who struggle. Uh, Does that on cause a daily tension basis. in your family at all? No, not at all. I think uh, there's a lot of understanding of what I'm trying to do. And it's really to provide services to people who need it. So it's not seeking to change their opinion about the environment necessarily. It's certainly seeking to change decision makers' opinions, but I'm not necessarily seeking to change communities' opinions on what should be done with their environment. Is it accurate, the, the way you put it a moment ago, mm -hmm. that the first thing you often hear from clients is, I'm no environmentalist? It might not be the very first thing. One of the more recent things I heard from a client who was dealing with shale gas impacts, at the very end of the call, I said, is there anything else you want me to know? And she said, well, you know, it's not like I'm drinking almond milk or something. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. That's terrific. Well, do, yeah. do, your, do you find that your clients wrestle consciously? Is this purely a personal thing for them or do they wrestle with the larger issue that they're a victim of? That's a great question. I think they do wrestle with the larger issue. As a whole, our entire clientele are just at their wits end, mostly because they feel like their government has abandoned them. And I think that's a really desperate place to be, at least wow. in the U.S. Wow. Yeah. It was a massive power grab. The EPA's regulators were putting people out of jobs by the hundreds of thousands. And regulations and permits started treating our wonderful small farmers and small businesses as if they were a major industrial polluter. They treated them horribly, horribly. If you want to build a new home, for example, you have to worry about getting hit with a huge fine if you fill in as much as a puddle, just a puddle on your lot. I've seen it. In fact, when it was first shown to me, I said, no, you're kidding, aren't you? But they weren't kidding. Because with today's executive order, I'm directing the EPA to take action, paving the way for the elimination of this very destructive and horrible rule. Year of the Trump presidency. There's been much focus on the president's track record when it comes to Congress and legislation. But just as notable is a major rollback of regulations throughout the federal government. Many critics worry that important protections are being lost. Does the EPA lack the teeth it once had? Yeah, not only are we seeing rules being rolled back, but we're also seeing a reduction in enforcement. I spent time in Ohio where there was a community where there was two different kinds of pollution occurring in the community, a hazardous 
this waste incinerator that was there that had been chronically sending toxic pollutants into the air on one side of town. The other side of town, there was a metal ingredient processing plant that was sending manganese into the air uh, in, in a way that, that some thought was threatening the health of local children. And there has been no action to finalize enforcement against those companies. And we saw lots of cases where there has been a decline in the number of initiated cases and in the value of the fines being collected so far under the new administration. Do you ever get the impression that you turn a client into an environmentalist <laughs> through the process of engagement? I, I do. I know get, that's not your goal. I want right, to be clear. That right. I know that's no, that's. Not your goal. I appreciate that. Um, I think so. To be honest with you, I mean, I don't know that they would ever use that moniker as, as their you know identifying characteristic. But I think we often have clients who, at the beginning, have told us they're not an environmentalist, and you know those things don't matter to them. Who are faced with a decision and will take a step back and say, you know. I want to make sure this is better for everyone, not just me. How do I do that? So they, they're asking us, you know, how to make a better decision for the public interest. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably pretty close to being an environmentalist. <laughs> You've said that, as it turns out, lawyering seems to have much more to do with compassion and addressing people where they really are rather than where we think they should be. Is that an example of that for you, understanding that dynamic? Yeah. So internally at Fair Shake, we have had many, many discussions about how we as fairly privileged individuals can walk into a community and counsel them appropriately to make decisions about their environmental future. And again and again, it's about listening. You know, it's about understanding what it is that that community actually wants and how they're balancing all of these conflicting interests potentially. You know, the jobs versus environment conundrum almost never comes up for us. <laughs> it doesn't. No, it really doesn't. It's I think people feel very strongly that whatever has happened to them, it's just a wrong. So right. there's right and wrong and whatever has happened to them is wrong. You know, if you look at a zip code map of our clients, all of those districts voted for the current president. Thank you, everybody. Can you hear me? I can understand why. <laughs> it's because they feel so desperate that they want change no matter how crazy it might be. So they're really seeking to have a voice again, even if it might not be completely representative of who they are. And my experience is that it's not. Maybe they have a chance of being heard again. And partly what you so clearly work to do is give them a voice so that yes. they can be heard. Right. You've also said something I've never heard a lawyer say, which is that you have to essentially admit that you know nothing. Yeah. I don't think that's very common to hear lawyers <laughs> say that. So, no. So is that also part of the listening that you just described? Absolutely. So I think a lot of attorneys are great decision makers about what the law can potentially achieve. But there's so much more to mm. decision making in a legal context. I mean, the social implications, the environmental implications, the community implications are not something that I could ever make a decision about for my clients. That's their decision to make. And we can certainly point out to them what we see, but we have no idea what it's like to be our clients in the context that they're in. So what are the environmental threats that you're clients are mostly encountering? What are the big mm. ones? We talk a lot about clients who are affected by various stages of shale gas development. Believe it or not, coal mining is a major part of our docket right now. And it, it has been since we started up. There's water loss. So clients in rural settings literally have to deal with losing their water supply, and it's typically the only water supply they have. Sometimes it's a contaminated water supply. So it's diverse. Health impacts, too? There are lots of health impacts. And I'll, I'll say very frankly, I think the health impacts are the hardest thing for us to deal with, just because there aren't many studies out there yet on how exactly you know we link, say, emissions from a compressor station mm -hmm 
to the person living 300 feet away and nosebleeds and all kinds of uh, respiratory issues that we hear clients complaining about. You know, having an expert witness to link those things conclusively is very difficult. We just didn't have a process, I think, for welcoming a new industry <laughs> into the mix. So it seems like we were playing catch up as a nation on how to deal with a new industry coming up through our environmental permitting and enforcement process. It's been difficult. It's been really difficult for people to face new development in areas that typically don't see development. Tonight on the Fox News Job Hunt, we find a pot of employment gold at the end of an expanding energy rainbow. Welcome to laid-back Lycoming County, Pennsylvania, unlikely epicenter of a new American gold rush. Horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing or fracking. But like all American gold rushes, shale is generating jobs and controversy. Environmentalists claim fracking leads to severe contamination of water supplies. These photographs of a Chesapeake you used to work on cases that impacted one waterway or one parcel and yeah. now you find yourself writing sentences like this project will disturb 246 acres resulting in impacts to 14 wetlands, one pond and 67 streams. Really? Yes. So those are typically pipeline cases, right? Mm. It's mind boggling to think through the enormity of impact that a single pipeline could have. So many parcels crossed, so many streams crossed. The fast pace of the development, too, I think is a concern. We're seeing, you know, reports on explosions and things like that. But yeah, I've never experienced until now, you know, cases where we're considering that many stream crossings all at once. Yeah. I recognize that in a way this isn't your fight, but mm -hmm. how do you as a lawyer, when confronted with the argument, look, okay, fine, you've got to protect your clients, but we need those pipelines mm -hmm. and we need those jobs and mm -hmm. we need those coal mines and we need those shale pads. Mm -hmm. How do you get underneath that with people to help them understand the stakes on the other side? Let's say it's an enforcement matter where we're seeking penalties for violations of the Clean Air Act. The amount of money that it would take to pay those penalties. Most of our clients feel like, hey, that's the cost of doing business. You decided to violate this law. You're going to have to incorporate that into your your matrix of profit, right? And I think that's fair. That's what the law actually envisions. So I don't think I've ever had to present to a judge that this penalty is going to cost people jobs. So I guess we don't have to get into it that much. Certainly in our coal mining cases, that's a public threat all the time. But it's more in the media than it is in an actual case. And a lot of our clients actually, you know, have worked in the mines and mm. they're the ones who are suffering. But they're thinking more, you know, I have a right to this water. Mm. You know, I, I, yeah, a water supply versus a job. I mean, that's a very difficult Doesn't thing to seem negotiate. Doesn't like it's a choice you should <laughs> right. have to make, right? Right. The term that people in my field love to use to mm. describe what you're fighting for is environmental justice. Right. And that term gets made fun of a lot mm. politically by people who dismiss it as a concern mm. of environmentalists and, mm. and people who just care about greening the planet. Mm. Why is it not? Why is this fundamental for people who, like your clients, mm -hmm are working for a living, don't have a lot of money, struggle to make ends meet. Why does it right. matter to them? I don't think the folks who are making fun of that definition <laughs> or, or even the concept of environmental justice have ever experienced some of the things that our clients are experiencing. When you don't have water for even a number of days, it's an emergency. When you're experiencing in your own home or on your own property, headaches and nosebleeds, boy, home's supposed to be a place where you're safe, you know? I don't think uh, there's any question that there's a fundamental right to clean air and pure water. It's not a fundamental right, technically, under the law in all jurisdictions. It is in Pennsylvania, but in Ohio, for example, we don't have a constitutional amendment to rely on for that fundamental right. You know, there aren't too many issues environmentally that make the poor poorer, but the kinds of issues we deal with, that's literally what we're facing. There's no way to 
for lead issues, for example, which, you know, in Pittsburgh is certainly an issue. Huge issue. Yeah. In Cleveland, it's an issue. You know, we, we are damaging people's livelihoods long term. And there's no way we can expect people to get ahead. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Same thing in Clareton, I think. We're dealing them a hand that is, you know, they don't even have the right number of cards. Right. <laughs> it's just right. horrible. It's not a fair game at That's all. right. It's hard. It's mm-hmm. really hard. And, you know, law gives us a way of determining what's right and wrong and often gets it wrong. <laughs> so, mm. is, there, is there any hope for a law that mm. takes more of that moral imperative around treatment of the disadvantaged and the poor into account? I think there is a way that we can make better environmental decisions if we are able to involve everyone who matters with existing law. I guess the answer is yes. But we'd have to define who matters more broadly right. than we do. So, As a lawyer, you're supposed to remain dispassionate, mm. but do you ever find yourself being drawn emotionally in? Oh, absolutely. All the time. You, you can be dispassionate. You can become hardened. But yeah, I, I mean, we're human beings. Mm. <laughs> so <laughs> a lot of our clients love their place. You know, they, they love where they're from. They feel really proud of it. And that that place has become a place that could potentially harm them, not because of something they've done, but because of something someone else decides to do. That always hurts. I feel like people should be able to exist in a place that they're proud of. One of the reasons I love this podcast is I get to interview people who are impossibly cooler than I am. And <laughs> one of the ways that you're cool is you mm-hmm run marathons and you cycle and you actually make it a point to run the communities yeah. that you serve. Right. Why do you do that? I don't think I can fully understand my clients without seeing what they're facing. When you are able to do that by foot, you experience it differently and people treat you differently too. So they see that you're becoming part of the place that they love they see that you're willing to experience it. And in large part, I'm welcomed. I mean, that's kind of the definition of community is that you feel welcomed in a place. As part of that process, you know, I become a better advocate. You're going up in these cases uh, many times against large companies mm-hmm. with deep pockets right. and highly qualified legal teams mm-hmm. that will bring all the weight to bear that they can Mm -hmm. on a case that they want to fight for. And they'll bring up the importance of their jobs to the community and they'll bring up the connection they've had with people in the community. Do you ever feel overwhelmed by that? Is it a, a constant David and Goliath thing? And how do you manage that psychologically? It's usually David versus two Goliaths. So it's government and industry Mm -hmm. versus our client, right? Which is really hard. It's hard on our young attorneys, especially who are, you know, navigating both the initial, you know, kind of impassioned part of what they're doing and the skills based part of what they're doing. But I think it makes us a much stronger legal team. What I really love about Fair Shake is that we can provide the same quality that some of these industrial folks are able to enjoy to somebody who would otherwise never want to talk to a lawyer Mm -hmm. (laughs) at all. Psychologically, I think it actually just makes us more nimble. If you realize that you can tackle a case where people have better resources and do it well, you become much more empowered. Ms. Carson maintains that The balance of nature is a major force in the survival of man, whereas the modern chemist, the modern biologist, the modern scientist believes that man is steadily controlling nature. Now, uh, to these people, apparently, the the balance of nature was something that was um, repealed as soon as man came on the scene. Well, you might just as well assume that you could repeal the the law of gravity. Women have long been a force in the environmental movement. Mm. Yeah. And you're now a part of that tradition, Mm. carrying it forward. Did you have a first environmental hero that impelled you in this direction? Well, 
probably my mom, who is probably the most thoughtful steward of the environment who I've ever met. But, you know, in, in the traditional sense, certainly Rachel Carson. Yeah. Well, we can stick with your mom for a second. <laughs> okay. So did she ever talk to you about these issues? No, but she often uh, brings up to me a letter that I wrote that I don't know why she still has it. I hope she actually submitted it when I was quite young, you know, about <laughs> who I think I called the mad mower, who was really destroying the sides of all of the roads with this gigantic arm off of a tractor that mowed the sides and clearly eroded all of the sides of these rural landscapes. So I had written a letter, I think, in junior high, if not elementary school, mm. about that. And she likes to tell me that it's not her. It's something that I felt early on. But she spent a lot of time being outside with us mm. and encouraged us to be outside. The balance of nature is built of a series of interrelationships between living things and between living things and their environment. You can't just step in with some brute force and change one thing without changing a good many others. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, that we must never interfere that we must not attempt to tilt that balance of nature in our favor. But unless we do bring these chemicals under better control, we are certainly headed for disaster. And Rachel Carson is one of my heroes as well. Mm -hmm. Do you ever find it daunting to think about her work in Silent Spring and the warning she provided against toxins in the environment. And now we are living through what scientists call the sixth extinction. So we, in some ways, are living through exactly what Rachel Carson warned right. us about. Is it daunting for you to consider your piece of the work in the context of that? Or, or do you draw inspiration from it? I certainly draw inspiration from it. I, I don't see the need to be a hero. I think my clients are the heroes, you know, mm. that they're stepping up to do something about a harm to them personally, to a place that they love, takes such courage and sense of self mm. that I don't know that I could ever be, you know, as strong as they are. What I'd really like to see is kind of institutional change in law. So the way we're, we're representing clients is something that I'd like to see change in the ability of people to access uh, environmental justice. So I don't know that I ever could imagine single-handedly, you know, being that hero that achieves environmental justice. But what I can do is allow people to make better decisions or decisions at all about what should happen in their own communities. I want to pick up on what you said a moment ago about the courage that it takes mm. for a client to step up. Why does it take courage? I think because they know that the world's against them. Including their own communities? Sometimes, yeah. I can think of a client right now, just off the top of my head, several clients actually, who have been outcast because they've taken mm. a stand against something like a, a lumber mill that is creating a lot of dust and affecting clients' respiratory system. Standing up to that kind of thing means you're disrupting other people in the community. And mm. that kind of conflict is very difficult in small communities. So it takes a lot of courage to say, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I, need, I need somebody to help me through this process. One more thing I want to ask you about sure. before we close okay. is because it's, it's just a wonderful story. But you yeah. have this love of nature and you have a love of animals. Yes. And you have such an interesting origin story with right. one of your pets. Can I you do. share that with us? Yes. So I have a two-year-old dog now. Her name is Isa. And she was found along with three siblings, I believe it was, and her mother on a raft 20-some miles off the coast of Mexico. And it was shortly after a hurricane had gone through. And a couple of fishermen found this raft with these dogs on it and no people. The dogs were horribly sunburnt, very weathered and were taken to a clinic on La Isla Mujeres in Mexico 
where it just so happens that a woman who I had bought my house from retired to and, you know, encountered these dogs and nursed them back to health and informed many people, not just me, that they were available for adoption once they were back to health. But it's pretty clear that they came from Cuba and perhaps there were people on that raft in the beginning. Mm. And But a hurricane came through and somehow the dogs stayed on the raft and made it. <laughs> so nice. so she's famous. She's much more famous than me. That's, that's fabulous. <laughs> we always conclude this program by referencing the name, which is We Can Be, mm-hmm. and asking you to complete that. Hmm. What's on your mind in terms of We Can Be? When I think of we, I often think of attorneys. And I think attorneys can be more inclusive. We're the ones who hold the keys to justice. We're the ones who can open those gates and allow people in. And I think oftentimes people are excluded from accessing those gates just because we're thinking about top dollar. So if you're able to adjust as an attorney your own decision making about who deserves justice, then I think we we can better achieve environmental justice. Fabulous. Emily, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. There is so much here in Emily's work, her emphasis on listening and meeting people where they are, even for trained experts needing to understand the communities that they serve, her knowledge of the courage it takes for her clients to step forward, the phenomenon of them then becoming a David against two Goliaths, large industry and government. How sometimes they can feel like outcasts and sometimes arrive at the table as people who have never thought about the environment at all, but who are changed by their experience of injustice. How so often the folks that she is serving weren't thinking in terms of the environment versus the economy, just simply about what's right about justice for themselves, for their families, for their friends, and for their communities. And their solid conviction that people have a right to air they can breathe and water they can drink. 